We've heard a lot today about some interesting ideas on lunar missions. And one of the things that sort of stop things is the cost of these missions. So what I'm going to talk about is essentially a, a cheap and very quick mission to the moon. It could be done in less than three years. Uh, Dave Huntsman and I were talking about this before. This does not mean three years to get to the moon from launch. <laughs> I think about 13 miles an hour, so uh, even a 74 Chevy Vega can do better than that. But um, we're talking about program starts to actually doing the mission in three years or less. There we go. So we were looking at CSI, why haven't we returned to the moon? Everybody's talking about going back to the moon. And if you look at the missions that have been funded since 72, you've got Clementine and Lunar Prospector, both relatively cheap in, in the greater scheme of space missions. So we were looking and saying, you know, funding really is the key here. So if it were free to go to the moon, obviously we'd all be there. And if the mission's going to cost a trillion dollars, no one's going to go there. So the key, we think, is you know, don't ask for more money for missions at this point. Look for cheaper missions. One way to get cheaper missions, uh, we believe, is to reuse existing hardware. Look at the things that are already out there, the things that are already flying, especially stuff that has been designed for the lunar environment. Another way to reduce costs is to leverage assets that are already in space. You've already paid the price of launching them, so why not use those assets? Another thing we think is that certainly people have talked about international cooperation. That's one way to, to help things along. We also think that commercial missions are, are a way to reduce price. And we don't mean commercial. We don't mean contractors. We actually mean uh, with private capital at stake. And uh, we think that we have a mission here would, which can close with even just one commercial customer. Let's see here. There we go. You can click the title of that. I'm going to see if this uh, animation here opens up. Both Chris Farinetta and I were having problems with our PowerPoint animations. So imagine, if you will, that you're a space tourist. You've paid your money. You're up at space station. You've had a great stay, looked out at the Earth, seen the curvature of the black sky and all that. And you're getting ready to go home. Well, before you go home, someone decides they're going to launch a proton or other launch vehicle that has a funny looking thing on the nose. What that is, will be is a container that has support for a lunar mission. That container will be attached to an upper stage. In this case, that's the uh, Breeze M upper stage. So you get in your Soyuz with the, with the cosmonauts or everyone else, and getting ready to go. Instead of just doing a standard Urantu, you rendezvous and dock with this lunar logistics container that's attached to an upper stage. And this can be done fairly close to ISS. But you want to do it outside of the ISS control zone. And then the upper stage does a burn and takes you on a translunar injection uh, free return trajectory. Uh, the interesting thing about the Breeze upper stage is it has a uh, drop tank, which gives it some interesting performance characteristics. So the drop tank separates, and then the upper stage will separate after it does additional burns. So you're headed off to the moon. And after the upper stage separates, one thing you can have, for example, on that aft end of, of the container is a nice big porthole, so you can be looking out, because what you're going to look at is the surface of the moon. You're doing an Apollo 8-style mission, which hasn't been done in a number of years, and you're doing it just as a private citizen. You get to see things that only the astronauts have seen, all the Apollo astronauts have seen so far, Earth rise over, over the lunar surface, things like that. And one of the things that this, as I said, this container, you not only the logistics support, but it gives you some elbow room. It gives you places to put portholes, things like that. It gives you a place to stick the high gain antenna so you could talk back to Earth and maybe send back uh, high definition uh, video, things like that. Anyway, separate, coming back. Standard double skip re entry for lunar return. And land in these steps of Kazakhstan. And unfortunately, I'm not a space historian, so I don't remember. That was that's that's one of the uh, Soyuz missions. Is that the 
<laughs> Constellation Services International. So anyway, this is just a stylized architectural graph of what you just saw with the animation. So what are the features, the, the defining uh, characteristics of this mission? One, uh, and I'll talk about how this can be done in less than three years from program start. It's low cost using off-the-shelf flight hardware, Soyuz existing vehicles. Um, it avoids major, major modifications to the Soyuz to support lunar missions. And you can actually, if you're thinking about this lunar logistics container, if you want to look at U.S. launch vehicles for whatever reason, you can then launch it from the U.S. But what are the benefits of this kind of mission? What does this get you? Well, the first thing is this could be a 100% commercial lunar mission. Second thing is we think it has lower risk than other proposals for, for missions like that because we're avoiding major modifications to the Soyuz spacecraft with the exception of a modification that has already been done in the past, and I'll talk about that in a moment. It also has piggyback opportunities, as I mentioned, you know, uh, high-definition video or IMAX movies or, you know, you can drop things off on the way, whatever. Um, below that line, I separated the sort of the top benefits there are more the commercial benefits. The bottom ones are, are benefits more pertaining to government space agencies. So, for example, we can reestablish lunar operations very quickly, and we think that could be an important uh, factor in sustaining the vision for space exploration. For example, NASA learned a lot in transitioning from just doing space shuttle operations and that whole style of, of how you do a mission to a sustaining space station operational regime. But they have no experience base left in lunar missions. So that will be another learning curve they'll have to get up on. And this is a way to help start getting up that learning curve. We also think it supports the international partner uh, sort of re functional redundancy in the vision for space exploration. NASA has said that they really don't want other countries in the critical path now, one way to av avoid that is to have not necessarily them involved in the main program, but that they have functional redundancy. They can do things with other systems, not necessarily the EV program itself. Uh, we think it could provide a pathfinder for CEV similar to the way that Gemini was a pathfinder for Apollo, not in terms of a hardware sense, but in terms of an operation sense, a, a technology sense. And finally, it can also be a test bed for new technologies, radiation shielding, things like that. Um, and one of the things uh, that, that people have talked about is understanding what happens in the human body on return from Earth. So you, here you will have an astronaut or a cosmonaut who's been up in uh, Earth months, and now he will be subjected to lunar return G loads as opposed to just LEO return G loads because lunar loads are, are higher. A couple other things you can do with this. You can do a lunar polar flyby. If you want, you can do an EVA on the way out or on the way back in, in cis-lunar space. Uh, you can tether, if you want to, you can tether the upper stage and the Soyuz and start doing uh, artificial gravity experiments, partial G, which is one of the big unknowns in terms of what is the minimum partial G level acceptable to avoid long-term degradation of, of bone mass for things like Mars missions and things like that. Um, and also you can do some other unique science stuff. So Pablo Picasso and a lot of other artists and writers and, and poets and people have always said that, that great artists, you know, uh, good, ar good artists borrow and great artists steal. And what that means is that a lot of inspiration, creativity, new ideas don't come out of nothing, but rather they come from taking previous ideas that have perhaps been discarded and combining those in a unique fashion to, get, to create something new. And that's kind of what we did here, is we took essentially four ideas. The first were from uh, mid-60s, McDonnell Douglas had done some proposals for extended Gemini missions. The first was they were actually looking at sending Gemini to the moon on this kind of mission, a, a translunar and Gemini return swing by orbit. The second thing they looked at was, was docking the Gemini with an orbital shelter attached to an Agena upper stage. Now, they never combined those two ideas. But we started combining that and said, well, you know, what if you did that with Soyuz? Could a Soyuz go to the moon? Well, the fact is Soyuz capsules, return capsules, actually have gone to the moon four times on the Zond missions. One of the major modifications there is, is that heat shield, which I'll talk about. And then the fourth idea that, that sort of action in some ways formed the impetus of this was we were looking at delivering cargo to space station. 
using a system derived from the progress vehicle to create a cargo container that would be launched on an upper stage, held up there, progress come down dock, go to ISS. So we just modified that a little bit, said, okay, we now have a different kind of container with a different function. The upper stage doesn't dock, it doesn't dock with a progress, but docks with a fuse. And instead of going to ISS, it goes to the moon. But the, the same sort of elements are there. So the lunar logistics container that we envision is derived from our ISS cargo container, which is itself derived from Soyuz and Progress, uh, just like the shuttle mirror docking module was or the ISS Piers docking compartment one. Um, the reason we like this lunar logistics container is we think it increases safety for the crew, just like on Apollo 13, where the team was able to provide backup ECLAS functionality. In this case, you could have segregate your life support between Soyuz and the logistics container for redundancy that way. Gives you a place to hang the lunar uh, high gain antenna. Gives you additional volume for elbow room during the you know, six day mission. Uh, it actually allows the Soyuz to, to dock to something. And it does this all pretty cheaply. So this is really the next step in 35 years of Soyuz evolution. The progress vehicle itself is derived from Soyuz. As I said before, shuttle mirror docking module, ISS peers. And so our cargo system and this lunar system, just the next step in this. Um, just to note, when we were looking at the ISS system, we had come up with an internal schedule of 24 months to, from, uh, to launch in, uh, this system. We had RSC Energia do a feasibility study for our system, and they said they could do it in as little as 18 months. So that gives us a lot of confidence that a lunar container with those lunar systems could be done in yeah, 24 months, but let's be conservative and throw another year on top of that. So less than three years. And also we went through a NASA system design review on this system. So we're talking about cost. Let's compare the cost here. Because one of the interesting aspects of this is this lunar mission is a piggyback, in a sense, to the mission to ISS. The Soyuz has to go anyway. So all you're really paying is the incremental cost for the lunar logistics container and the launch vehicle to put it up there. And this is just a, an example of you know, comparing Saturn V versus the Proton Breeze M, which is what would launch the uh, lunar logistics container. And the most important thing there is the price in $04. Uh, Saturn V was about $2.4 billion to launch. And the last price I heard, a public price, I don't, the, uh, Actual prices are a bit less, but publicly stated price for Proton Breeze M is about 125 million. <coughs> Excuse me. So some technical issues, as I mentioned, uh, you need a thickened heat shield, but that was demonstrated on the Zond program. Now the question is, are you need to recertify that for uh, having people on board? That that's a question right now. We do know that the mass penalty back in the Zond program is about 300 grams. If you decide that you have to recertify a new system, perhaps you could use some new technology, uh, new, newer technology than, than uh, late 60s, early 70s to reduce that. The other thing is in terms of the mission uh, ops itself, if you're launching to the moon from ISS because of the rate of differential nodal regression, you only get about three launch opportunities per month at, at kind of a minimum delta V. You have to then consider lighting cons constraints, issues you know, uh, for crew safety, such as the docking to the upper stage and all that. So it may turn out that once you run through all the numbers, you don't get three opportunities a month. Maybe you get one opportunity every six months when that makes sense. But still, we think that's more than sufficient for any kind of commercial needs. Um, the other thing right now is the uh, Soyuz is currently qualified for 200 days on orbit. I believe the number is actually 210. They typically swap out at about 180 days. So I mean, you are taking six extra days in the Soyuz lifetime versus what it currently does, but we think that there's sufficient margin within the system to accommodate that. Now, as I said, you know, we need to do the systems analysis on this thing. I mean, right now it's at a high concept level, and this is just one small example. And, and it seems kind of funny when you think about, it. oh, geez, we need a toilet. But, you know, the current Soyuz toilet designed for only a couple of days for three guys. Now you're doubling the duration. So you need a bigger one. Well, that means you need power for it. Where do you get that power? 
all that chains through the system, so we have to, have to do that analysis. But let's say you accept that this mission could be done, then there's some other things you can do. For example, instead of using a Soyuz, let's use a progress. Let's take it out to L1, maybe as a staging point for future missions or spaceport or whatever. It kind of looked like that. Very similar in, in some ways to our ISS cargo mission, but instead of going back to ISS after the docking, you're going to L1. Other applications, thinking beyond that. Let's say this does get established. Let's say we do have a human translunar capability that we can use. We can go, I mean, Mars missions, that's a, that's a bit of a stretch. Opportunities for NEO missions kind of infrequent because of the orbital mechanics. But what if there were places where you could go relatively frequently, where you had launch windows that, that are fairly regular, where your travel times aren't that much longer, and you had a reason to go? And the Sun-Earth L2 point may be one of those places. Starting in 07, there's going to be a group of satellites that are out there. And this is the list of them and who's launching them and years, et cetera, et cetera. But you can get there, kind of a, a lunar, uh, doing a lunar mission. Uh, you do have to do some stabilization once you're there because it's not a stable point. But the point is, what if a Soyuz, or what if a COT spacecraft, for that matter, could not only get to the moon, but go to L2. What if you could start doing satellite repair out there on these spacecraft at L2? The next, you know, beyond Hubble servicing, but the James Webb Space Telescope servicing, things like that. I mean, because if, if we can go to the moon and we're supposed to go to Mars, right, is L2 then too far to go, or is there, you know, some, some neat reason to go there? So what's next? Well, we think a commercial company could put this deal together. The, the, here's an outline of one possible deal. There, there's many of them. But, you know, if you have a Russian pilot, an ESA astronaut, and one paying passenger, the Russians bring the proton. ESA brings, you know, a passenger, astronaut, et cetera, et cetera. Or you could launch on an Ariane 5. And, in fact, the uh, ESV uh, upper stage with this relatable capability might even be able to get lunar orbit as opposed to lunar swing by. But maybe that's something for the third or fourth customer down the road to, to consider, as opposed to the first customer. Anyway, the bottom line is the, uh, where we are right now, CSI and Space Adventures, and you'll be hearing from Chris Farinetta uh, as the closing speaker today, we've signed an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, to discuss and, and assess the possible applications of this lunar architecture, talk about ISS cargo opportunities, and see what's there. Now, normally, I would take questions at this point, but since we are behind time, I'm going to try to catch us up and say, I'll be sitting in the back. Anybody wants to ask me any questions, please feel free. I'll be here uh, through Sunday taking the red eye out. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Another brilliantly timed conference. Um, <laughs> now, my associate Jeff Feige is the chairman, and as wonderful as usual, it's a wonderful conference, and I'm glad to be here with all of you. And having been a co-founder of this organization that we started 18 years ago, um, here we are, still fighting the fight, still laying out great ideas, still talking about business plans and strategies, and and where we're going to plant the bomb at NASA head. Um, Anyways, um, I, I, did I say that? Did I say, um, um, the topic of my speech today is how should NASA leave the moon? One might think that's a fairly strange question to ask. NASA isn't on the moon. They haven't gotten back there yet. Um, but I'm going to suggest in the spirit of Peter Drucker, uh, the great American philosopher of management who passed away last year, um, that there is incredible power in asking the right question, the right strategic question. Okay? And it's not necessarily a question to which there is a ready answer, and there's certainly not necessarily a question to which there is an enduring answer. Like it's the right answer forever if you come up with a right answer for it may be different. The classic question he always asked for a business is, what is our business and what should it be? Like, not 
what do we do, but what business are we in? Really fundamentally, what business are we in? Um, and the question I'm going to suggest that we should start asking with regards to lunar exploration and lunar development and lunar settlement and NASA's lunar uh, return efforts and international lunar return efforts and commercial lunar return and exploration development and settlement efforts is how should NASA leave the moon? The reason is because it's easy for us to get into talking about how NASA will go back there. It's a natural thing for us to want to talk about. At last year's Return to the Moon conference, I gave one of the closing speeches, and in it what I laid out was that you had had presentations the day before by both Chris Shank, um, who was the uh, uh, head of strategic investments uh, for uh, Administrator Griffin, uh, and then, then by Brant Sponberg, the program executive for uh, innovative programs and what, what has become the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, COTS program um, at NASA headquarters. And what they basically laid out was, is that, you know, it's Chris laid out that, you know, we can get there if we end up, if NASA is dependent upon the crew exploration vehicle for servicing ISS. That if we have to use the CEV to service ISS, we can't build the heavy lift launch vehicle system and the Earth departure stage system that will actually carry the crew exploration vehicle to the moon. Um, and Brand Sponberg laid out the overall architecture of innovative programs, including both commercial cargo ISS and commercial cargo return and eventually crew transfer to and from ISS and, and, and a whole other range of, uh, a whole spectrum of uh, of ways that he was going to engage the private sector and the entrepreneurial sector uh, in, the, in the vision for space exploration. And what I said in the closing speech was basically, you know, we've actually reached a fairly interesting point where the Space Frontier Foundation has been forever set up, been arguing that what NASA should do is get out of low Earth orbit and go back to the exploration business go on to the moon, to Mars, and go do other things, okay? In fact, the very first project of this organization was a return to the moon petition drive, which ironically enough was used as evidence of grassroots support for a return to the moon program by the Bush White House in 1989 internally to help justify making, this, making the political case for going ahead and giving the speech that they wanted to give anyways. Um, for what became the, uh, the Space Exploration Initiative back in 1989. What I said was, is, you know, we've reached a pretty interesting moment here. What the Space Frontier Foundation should do is declare victory. We should claim low Earth orbit spaceflight for us. We should say, okay, NASA admits it. They can't do it and do exploration. So we should claim LEO. We should say that's what we're going to do. And that's what new space is going to do. That is what the entrepreneurial sector and the, and the commercial sector and those parts of our great aerospace companies in this, in this country who want to do things on a fixed price basis, that's what we should focus on. And then in terms of NASA's architecture that they were already starting to lay out for exploration, for building lunar transportation systems, we should let them lay out their plans for doing that. We shouldn't really fight with them about that. Because that's what they're going to go do while they turn over low Earth orbit to us. And what we really need to do is focus on actually performing, actually delivering in low Earth orbit. At the same time, what NASA had not done any work on and was not really doing any work on was defining what it was we were going to do on the moon. What NASA was going to do, having been given the assignment by the, by the President and the Congress, was going to go build a transportation infrastructure for getting to the moon. Great. That's what they're going to do. Go do it. They're going to, they're going to set that up. And I said, great. Let them do that. Let's not get embroiled in too many of them over how they're going to do that. Let's say, here's what you're going to do on the moon. 
Because after all, the Space Frontier Foundation is the organization of people who have the vision of what we want to do on the moon, right? What it's about, what the real objective is, what the real goal is, what the vision of lunar exploration de development and settlement is. We know that there's a, that we know what NASA wants to do on the moon very generally. They want to learn how to do exploration again, which means learning some engineering, learning some technology, maybe doing a little science, but basically get back in the business and like teach themselves how to do be on another planet, on, a, on another planetary surface for the first time in 35 years. So they can then go to Mars having actually done something, actually having rebuilt the organization that could do it 35 years ago but doesn't exist anymore, then they will be able to go to Mars. Now, it's very tempting for us, especially given that NASA is already having problems with their lunar transportation architecture, to want to get into that dis debate and discussion. And I'm going to suggest that while we all have our technical and business and economic and political and policy and other views, maybe civilization or cultural views of how good it is or whether it's a good idea to that architecture, it really doesn't matter. What matters is what is it all about? What's going to happen on the moon? And most especially, what's going to happen on the moon that leads to the kind of future we want on the moon? You know, we used to joke, if God had meant humans to settle the solar system, they would have given us a moon. And God did give us a moon. A gas station, right in our own neighborhood. A source of breathable oxygen, a source of raw materials, a place to live. If we try to not just define a plan of what to do on the moon and a rationale, but really a plan for how is NASA, once they do what they do on the moon, how is NASA going to stop doing because at some point, NASA is going to have to redevelop their capacity for exploration, and they won't be wanting to be on the moon anymore. They're going to want to go to Mars, which is good, because that's what we want them to do, because we want the moon, right? We know in, and, 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 and just for the record, you know, the foundation has always been supportive of human exploration. We've always been supportive of the idea that humanity should go to Mars and humans should land on Mars and that we should go do science and exploration on Mars. There is no fight between the moon and Mars in the foundation. We want, as we've said often, all of the above. The moon just happens to be first. And there happen to be things, economic opportunities and commercial opportunities that exist four to three days travel from the Earth that exist in two to six months travel, depending on, on, on your propulsion system. If you think of NASA as an organization that carries out large engineering projects, if you forget about the fact that they're in the space business, that what they are really is a very large engineering organization with large extensions of themselves out in the contractor community that does big engineering projects, then one could describe the history of the space program as a series of big engineering projects. And where NASA always gets into trouble is in the transition points between the different engineering projects. You know, go back and look at the fact that in the summer of 1969, as we were landing on the moon, Richard Nixon's Office of Management and Budget was actually ca canceling some advanced parts for Apollo 18, 19, and 20. And when Spiro Agnew turned in his report recommending to Mars and lots of other things that fall, it was laughed out of the White House. You know, once you've done something, that doesn't mean you get to keep doing it. That's one reason sometimes NASA stretches out projects or doesn't see a great tragedy in stretching out projects, because that means you postpone the, the issue of the transition to the next one. We know about the, the trans, how difficult the transition to shuttle was and how NASA barely survived that and had to do the shuttle on the cheap, leading to lots of problems. I happen to live through the transition between shuttle and station. And you may not think of them as different programs, 
but they were very different programs and had very different purposes. And the shuttle is about to come to an end. And we're in one of those transition points right now between shuttle and the next big human spaceflight vehicle that NASA owns and operates itself. The, the, there is no one NASA view of what they will do when they want to leave the moon or, fin or cease major operations on the moon, but the term of art that they use regarding that is abandon in place that they will build some sort of lunar infrastructure as part of whatever it is they're going to do on the moon and then they will abandon it in place to turn it over to whatever commercial interest might have an interest in it. And I'm going to suggest to you that down that road lies death for our dreams, for our vision, for our commercial opportunities, for our children's economic benefit and scientific benefit. Because if, once again, NASA designs a piece of infrastructure for its purposes and then expects that piece of infrastructure to have any interest whatsoever to the private sector, they will be fooling themselves and, worse yet, we will be fooling ourselves. Everyone knows, seven years ago, Daniel S. Golden, bless his heart, spoke at the Space Frontier Foundation's annual conference and said, I want to turn the keys of the space shuttle over to the private sector. Sounds ludicrous. And there's talk still about, you know, how are we going to transition the space station? when NASA ceases operations or may cease operations or activities at the space station. And there's, you know, some assumptions in the way people look at the vision for space exploration that somehow NASA's participation in the station will phase out or end in 2016. That's actually not what's in the policy, but, you know, at some point NASA will be doing less at space. How does it get, is, has space station been designed to be operable? Has space station been designed to be sustainable? Has space station been designed to be commercially expanded? Has Space Station been designed? Has NASA put in place the policy and business architecture required for affordable activities at Space Station? No, of course not. Because that was never the goal. The goal was to build a Space Station. Building it, learn how to build one. That's a good thing to do. But it has nothing to do with economic development and human settlement. And I would argue, not, and, and I think as NASA is demonstrating, it doesn't have a lot to do with getting a lot of science done either. So the issue of how will NASA leave the moon? What will they be doing on the moon and how will they transition out of doing it on the moon? What will be the framework within which they are doing what they're doing on the moon? Is NASA going to once again be the owner and operator of a lunar base and decree who gets to use it? Or will NASA be a tenant? Because conceivably NASA could be funding scientists to use a lunar base for years into the future while they're focusing on Mars exploration. There could still be NASA people on the moon. NASA could be doing some technical research to try out new life support systems that they want to use to improve their Mars habitat. But they want to try them out on the moon because it's safer to try the, those technologies out there in an isolated environment than to test them out that actually depend on the mission to go to Mars and see if they work out. And you, It's hard to tweak them and stuff. It's easier to tweak them when you can go back and forth to the moon. Just as they're going to do a little bit of that on the space station. Those questions, how going to run, how is humanity going to, quote, run, unquote, the moon? Those are fundamental issues that have not been addressed or decided. And now is the time to address them. Now is the time to ask the question, how will NASA leave the moon? Thanks very much. And I'll be good and not take questions.
Thank you, Mr. Monty. And now for our final speaker, um, Eric.